Defining subclasses in TF2 has always been a pretty shaky endeavor. Does it necessitate the altering of your playstyle? Does it require a shift in mindset? Is wearing the gibbous you deleted seven years ago a part of the mandatory dress code? It seems like everyone has their own definition in mind. However, if we look at the common consensus, we'll arrive at something pretty close to, oh, I don't know, this one. Now, a precondition to the concept of a subclass is that they're innately contingent against the quote-unquote traditional way of playing each class. Should that norm be botched through intense alteration of the game's mechanics, the wide variety of potential subclasses tend to follow suit. Man vs. Machine embodies this to a T. Some of the more archetypal subclasses, like the Pyro Shark, the Pie Bro, and the Hoovy are nowhere to be seen, but thanks to the shift in objectives and the big tub of clay that is the upgrade station, were able to mold entirely new breeds of subclasses into existence transforming the mundane into the spectacular. I'm not gonna talk about all of them, but hey, if El Maxo isn't gonna make Art of the Subclass 3, I may as well do it for him. Damage Scout is perhaps the greatest case study in showcasing the differences between MVM and the rest of TF2. I mean, come on, Damage Scout, really? That's a subclass? Well, believe it or not, yeah. In MVM, Scout's priorities resemble that of your average mainstream music artist. Money, fans, speed, and cum. As a result, he's the only DPS class in the game who was entirely redesigned for PvE, fixating less on unbridled offense and more so on utility. This comes in the form of forcing many crits onto giants, hunting down all the credits for your team, becoming the robot's center of attention, and making the medic rethink his career path every 20 seconds. That doesn't mean scout players should neglect using their scattergun, but it's only one piece of the pie rather than the whole ass plate. Damage Scout, on the other hand, is a return to form. Every weapon choice, every upgrade, every tactic used is tailored specifically towards topping the all-important damage meters. This means we're subbing the milk for the purple flurp and raw-dogging the mission with no resistances, all in exchange for a beefed-up primary. This may come at the cost of your team's overall survivability, but the Damage Scout doesn't care. He is a lone wolf preying on robots to unleash those mini crits, no damage fall off, bullet penetration onslaughts, and activating them at will with ammo canteens. The constant self-mark for death and close quarters combat may make this strategy more dangerous than dipping your balls in carnivine infested waters, but with great risk comes great reward. Giants get shredded in the blink of an eye, tank busting that matches a frickin' flog pyro. He can even one-shot ubermedics all while still being incentivized to collect the vast majority of the money for the team. The damage scout is not for the faint of heart or the low of tour counts, but when given the right avenue to shine, shine, they will. Has this ever happened to you? Well, it looks like you need a secondary that you can spam from long range, deal plenty of damage with, and is relatively cheap to upgrade compared to everything else. Could I interest you in one of these? People tend to have a rude awakening when they choose Pyro. He's not bad, but you kinda have to play him like you're the only kid left in a game of dodgeball. Wait, not that kind of dodgeball. Please, don't spam air blast. Point is, if you don't get off on being nailed to the floor at every opportunity, you're gonna wanna chill. Lay back a bit, you know? Introducing the Flare Gun Pyro. And when I say Flare Gun, I mean the Flare Gun. The detonator's added mobility doesn't make up for its lesser damage. The Man Melter fires about as fast as FPS Russia if that FPS was zero. And the Scorch Shot... Oh god, D don't use the Scorch Shot. This playstyle pretty much turns Pyro into a Diet Soldier, with each shot doing a total of 90 damage on burning opponents, the same damage as a standard rocket. However, unlike the Soldier, the Flare Gun doesn't have any splash damage effect or direct damage upgrades to increase its potency, a kryptonite that makes the ceiling of the Flare Gun Pyro exceptionally low. So yeah, the bar for his offensive presence isn't all that great, but fortunately, his accessibility is anything but. The Flare 
Flare Gun Pyro only needs 1200 credits in order to cap out his damage, a number usually achievable by Wave 2. In a way, he's very reminiscent of your Route 1 Butterfree. From start to finish, 90 damage per shot will always be your peak potential, even less so if a battalion soldier is on the field. That's a hard sell, and it's precisely why they're a rarity within the game, but his overwhelming security is undeniable. Comfort may be the killer of man, but it's not the killer of Merc. And on the bright side, the less I have to constantly hear, the better. When you think of the battle medic, you usually think of three things. The Blitzauger, random crits, and teammates who really need to check their cholesterol. But what if I told you that Man vs. Machine has its own version of the battle medic that has none of these traits? In fact, it's actually pretty good. Gentlemen, boys, gamers, I present to you the Shield Bash Medic. It's pretty self-explanatory. First you shield, then you bash. It sounds simple, but you'd be surprised at the amount of depth here. Whereas the traditional battle medic treats his medigun as nothing more than a paperweight, the shield bash medic is reliant on it. The more healing you put out, the faster your shields generate, and the more damage you can do. This is where the quick fix finds itself a niche. This medigun has a 40% faster healing rate, a feature unmatched by every other option at the medic's disposal. Now typically, shields are used for defensive purposes to protect against oncoming spam. Not with this set. It's now the medic's mission to have this big red rectangle shoved up the robot's noses at every turn. This means doing some unorthodox shit, like maxing out overheal expert before everything else to increase the health pools you're eligible to heal, using ubercharge when unnecessary just to proc another shield, and most obscurely, purposefully looking down at the ground to shift the shield's hurtbox to be closer towards you, minimizing the gap where the robots can attack you from inside of it. What is this, a fucking GoldenEye speedrun? The Shield Bash Medic is for that kind of player who looks at the soldier and says, yeah, I can beat that. But at the end of the day, it's more of a mindset thing than a rigid, all-or-nothing conformity. Yeah, it's preferred you use the optimal loadout, specific upgrade composition, and farm yourself a 112 while doing so, but as long as you're capitalizing on the moments that present themselves and aren't taking a jab at exposure therapy, shield bashing is a take on the battle medic you don't have to worry about getting kicked over. You see that clutchness? I am fucking clutch! It took us four entries to finally reach a subclass not contained solely to the confines of MBM. How's that for originality? On the surface, Demo Knight appears pretty much the same way he does everywhere else. You sub the pills and the stickies for a peg leg and a shield, carving your initials on anything that looks at you funny. But unlike all the other traditional subclasses in the game, Valve didn't throw Demo Knight to the wayside, blessing him and only him with two major benefits. The first of which is that each one of the demo swords unlocks a damage upgrade when equipped with a shield, a feature no other melee weapon in the game has. But his swords carry another upgrade, one of MVM's finest in fact crits on kill. These two upgrades combined allow Demo Knight to one-shot every small robot in the game and keep that kill train going as long as he has some fuel. However, considering the insane cost of these upgrades coupled with the resistance and health on kill upgrades you'll most certainly need to buy, Demo Knight is very top-heavy. In the early game, he's often compared to the Pyro except with less range, no air blast, and no long range fuck you secondary. And if Pyro isn't all that great in the early game, take a wild guess at how Demo Knight performs. Not good. In a similar vein to the Kunai Spy, the Demo Knight relies on small robots littering the field to keep his sword glowing red. And because the early waves have less emphasis on spam, it can often be hard to keep that spark lit for extended periods of time. While he does perform better on the later waves, ultimately Demo Knight's whole existence is a catch-22. While yes, the resources he requires are plentiful in the late game, so are Giants, and they are the Demo Knight's Achilles heel. This means that he isn't granted the same level of versatility that other classes possess, at least in gameplay. Weapons, on the other hand, are a different story. You got a sword that saves you less money on movement speed upgrades and increases your total health pool, a sword that lets you one-shot samurai demos and saves money by avoiding health on kill upgrades, and one that lets you surprisingly tank bust better than almost every other class in the game. There's also the Claymore and the Persuader, but, uh, 
Yeah. The shields are a bit more well-rounded, although they do still have their differences. The Charge and Targe and Splendid Screen are better in the early game thanks to their initial crit swing, while the Tide Turner gives more leeway for chaining kills and making escapes, but necessitates damage upgrades to get that deadly opening. Take your pick, it doesn't really matter all that much. The wave layouts won't always be in your favor, and you may get tossed around like a volleyball from time to time, but when you get your sprees going, you'll start feeling the glad in Gladiator. What happens when we take the worst engineer weapon in Man vs. Machine, combine it with one of the worst upgrades in Man vs. Machine, and pair it with a mid-tier primary for Man vs. Machine? Well, you get the Mini Sentry NG, also known as... Mini Sentry NGs are like magicians. By that, I mean they'll always mysteriously disappear before the game even starts. That being said, you can actually kinda make it work. Look, I'm not trying to load up a game of two cities after this and find myself bombarded by the gulag of Gunslinger Garys, but I'd be lying if I said there wasn't any synergy here. Let me explain. The Frontier Justice is a good weapon, but there is one, usually unnoticeable downside that hinders it severely in MBM. For every kill and assist your sentry gun gets, you will be granted one or two critical hits for the shotgun. Just one problem, the crit storage has a cap of 35. Now in regular TF2, this is rarely ever touched, as you'll need around 18 kills in a single life just to fill that quota. But any seasoned veteran of MBM will tell you that the engineer wipes his ass with 18 kills and blows through 35 shots like it's your average Monday. This forces the engineer into a sticky situation. Does he purposefully destroy his sentry in exchange for full utilization of his crits? Or does he keep his sentry alive but play the rest of the game with a neutered shotgun. Well, with the mini sentry, who cares? It'll constantly be destroyed due to how pathetically weak it is, it's quick and easy to rebuild, and it allows you to routinely pump out all the crits that you farm. What's notable here is that this also applies to the mini sentry upgrade, meaning you can effectively have two sources of constant crit generation. This flips the engineer meta on its head, not just in gameplay, but with upgrades as well. Staples of the engineer meta, like building health, wrench swing speed, and upgrade canteens turn into low priority upgrades, while disposable sentry and shotgun maximization, usually some of your worst choices, are your go-tos right after dispenser range. Funnily enough, this strategy actually does provide the Engineer with his best potential burst damage, barring the Widowmaker with the Crit Canteen. In many ways, the Mini Sentry NG is an act of liberation. It frees you up on credits to invest in your shotgun, frees you up to go melt down some giants instead of babysitting your sentry, and it frees you up to play other games, because unless you have a 3-digit tour count, good luck on convincing your team to let you play this. We're gonna end the video here, but I just want to say that there are a lot of other subclasses that we could talk about. So if you guys want to see a part 2 to this video, let me know in the comments below. But that's it for today. If you could do me a solid and boost the fancy internet numbers by liking the video, subscribing to the channel, and or leaving a comment, I would greatly appreciate that. Twitter and Discord are in the description as always, and that's all I got. See ya.